Mike, I appreciate that. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate uh, the Realtors Association having me here for today's webinar. Uh, I'm going to be talking about mortgage fraud in general, and I'm going to be trying to I'm going to try to give you some examples of cases I've worked here in South Carolina, just to give you a, a lay of the land of what we've seen locally. Um, and as a sorry about that. One of, one of my objectives here, as you'll see on the screen, is to introduce our agency to you if you don't know who we are um, and to give you a better understanding of some of the most common fraud schemes applicable to HUD and FHA insured loans. Um, HUD OIG stands for Housing and Urban Development Office of Inspector General. Um, we are one of the original 12 offices of Inspector General that was uh, authorized by Congress in 1978. Um, I'm going to be telling you a little bit about our mission. Um, we're an independent and objective organization. Our inspector general who heads our agency is, uh, he is appointed by the president and he's confirmed by Congress. Um, our agency has several different functions. My side of the house is the uh, Office of Investigations. We're criminal investigators and we do, you know, our primary mission is to investigate crime in any different fraud schemes against HUD. We also have an Office of Audit, <clears throat> which audits a lot of the different agencies, nonprofits, cities and states that receive HUD funding to make sure that money is being spent for the, for the way it was intended. Um, we also have a civil fraud division that investigates um, sort of a not criminal cases, but they'll go after some of the big banks if there's a widespread uh, mismanagement or, 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 or abuse in some of the, the HUD insured loan programs that could be systemic for the whole agency. Um, uh, the first Inspector General was appointed in 1972, which was about six years prior to the Inspector General Act being issued. Um, most of your large federal agencies all have an Office of Inspector General. Um, none of us, none of None of the agencies are huge agencies, um, but uh, our current Inspector General is David Montoya, who was sworn in approximately three years ago. Um, my office, the Office of Investigation, plans and conducts investigations. Um, <clears throat> we focus, uh, our focus could be on the integrity of the program, so sometimes we'll write what's called a systemic implication report, which is to tell the HUD program office um, that, hey, there's, a, there's an issue with this program that's being exploited and, and hopefully uh, we can get the, the programs changed to fix any loopholes that are allowing criminal or civil fraud to go into our program. Um, we also deal with personnel. We investigate personnel at different federal, state, and local agencies. Wherever the HUD money flows, sometimes there's different people that may get their hands on it that aren't supposed to and, and we'll investigate that whether it's you know st uh, state housing authorities, local housing authorities, different lenders. Um, we also investigate whistleblower retaliation and other matters involving alleged violations of law, rules, regulations, and policies. These are our main, these are like our, our special agent in charge offices. These are the big offices. Uh, I'm part of the Atlanta, Georgia region. I uh, previously worked out of Baltimore, Maryland, and Washington, D.C., as Mike mentioned on my introduction. Um, investigative results for last year. This is nationwide, not in, not in South Carolina. And uh, one thing before I go forward, I meant to say, if, if you all have any questions along the way, you can go ahead and submit them if you have a method to through the GoToWebinar app. And uh, I don't mind pausing to answer questions as we go along. Um, so last year's investigative results, um, this is nationwide, just for the Office of Inspector, just for the Office of Investigations. We recovered $88 million. Um, we made 333 arrests. We were responsible for 393 indictments, 423 convictions, and 291 administrative sanctions. Um, I'll talk more about the administrative sanctions because sometimes those may hurt more even than a criminal conviction. Um, if HUD 
puts you on the uh, suspension or debarment list or they issue you a limited denial of participation, we call it an LDP for short, where they'll just say, okay, for one year you can't, you can't be a part of any HUD loans. Um, it could hurt, hurt somebody's business, especially if you're a closing attorney, if you're a real estate agent, um, a loan officer, it could kind of, it could almost put you out of business, some of those uh, administrative sanctions they have. Um, these are some of the, the agencies that we partner with. Uh, we work closely with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Everybody knows them. Uh, we work with the Internal Revenue Service and the Postal Inspection Service works with us on mortgage fraud investigations because they can investigate mail fraud. Um, we primarily work with the U.S. Attorney's Office as our prosecutors. Um, sometimes if a case can't be uh, prosecuted by the U.S. Attorney's Office. We'll, in South Carolina, we would still talk to the solicitor's office or the attorney general's office depending on uh, what type of crime we're investigating. Um, the types of mortgage fraud I'm going to touch on today, or, or, or I'm sorry, let me back up. These are some of the more general stuff that OIG investigates, not just mortgage fraud, but also bankruptcy fraud, equity skimming, um, landlord assisted housing fraud, which is our, our, our public housing funds that go to the local housing authorities. Sometimes the landlords do different stuff that's prohibited that we investigate. We investigate bribery and kickbacks. Those are typically in grant, grant fraud type cases that may involve public officials. Um, if, if any of you follow the news last summer, there was a big public corruption trial here involving the former business partner of Mayor Benjamin, uh, Jonathan Pinson, and the Village of River's Edge LLC. Uh, HUD OIG was part of that investigation, and uh, there should be some sentencing on that case in the next week. Um, we also investigate conflicts of interest. Sometimes that does bleed over into mortgage fraud if, if there's non-arm's length transactions or if HUD prohibits certain relationships um, such as a, a realtor who may be negotiating a short sale and he may be business partners with the buyer but he's negotiating on behalf of the seller and the buyer basically, uh, you would have a conflict of interest there. Um, we investigate false statements to HUD, and that could be on any different type of program, grant fraud, housing benefits fraud, or single-family home loan fraud. Um, for the Office of Investigations, we, we look at each case with three different major, uh, basically you could call them approaches or, you know, with different ways to attack an investigation. Criminal is primarily what we do. Um, Sometimes, if it doesn't meet the criminal threshold, uh, I have a, a civil mortgage fraud case going right now where some of the allegations they they were older than five years when you know when the investigation was completed. Sort of the, the statute of limitations had run out on the specific charges we were going to use. Um, the civil side of the house allows for more time to file a civil case against a, uh, in this instance, it was a specific loan officer. Um, so we're pursuing civil remedies in that, in that area. Um, the third approach we have is administrative, as I already mentioned, with um, suspensions, debarments, um, limited denials of participation and also civil money penalties. It's, it's a way to, to basically find people without doing a criminal, a criminal prosecution, you can still find them. Um, I see we had our first question come in. Um, I'm gonna take a break here to read the first question. With the new federal agency Consumer Financial Protection Bureau taking jurisdiction on RESPA and other laws, will the Huddle IG rule change? And is there a counterpart investigation team at the CFPB that operates similarly to HUD OIG? Um, that is a good question. Um, if, I, if I don't have your answer, if I can't answer any of your questions, um, my contact information will be at the end of the PowerPoint presentation and you can reach out to me, um, send me an email and I'll try to get you an answer um, or refer you to somebody that can get you an answer. Um, 
as to your question, um, I believe our role, I believe Hunter YG no longer investigates RESPA, and I think that was as of a few years ago. Um, I'm not really sure who investigates RESPA now other than state, you know, like DLLR, Department of Labor Licensing and Regulation. I, I'm not really sure. Um, if you send me an email, um, I'm not sure if, if I type anything here, if it goes out to the audience. Um, I'm going to go ahead and type my email address in now. Okay. Um, and so you could, in case you have to leave before we're done with the webinar, you could go ahead and send your questions to me via email also. Okay. Um, my email is the letter J L O W E R Y at H U D O I G dot gov. Um, well, I'm sorry, I can't answer your question about rest, but I'm not sure who investigates it now uh, specifically. I know we do not anymore. Um, Some of the administrative ac actions I mentioned, um, suspensions from participation in HUD programs, debarment. Um, sometimes, like if, if we indict anybody that's in the real estate business, not necessarily realtors, but it could be loan officers, investors, um, closing attorneys, once they're indicted, they'll be suspended until their case is fully adjudicated. If they're found guilty, um, the debarments are typically three to five years, or sometimes we might negotiate a lifetime debarment, if, uh, if depending on, on the seriousness of their case. Um, we also have what's called the Program Fraud Civil Remedy Act, which is the Mini False Claims Act. It's stuff that's under 125,000. Um, like I mentioned earlier, some of the administrative actions are worse than getting a criminal conviction. If you if you're if you're doing business with HUD or or doing FHA loans, these are all the different types of people that we investigate. Um, I put real estate agents at the top. Um, they I just put them there for this webinar. But we also investigate mortgage brokers, loan officers, appraisers, title companies, uh, HUD grantees or sub grantees, home buyers and speculators. We typically Please stay away from home buyers, but um, sometimes some of them do things that are more egregious than a typical home buyer. Um, assisted housing landlords, um, all OIGs investigate their own employees, but some of them more than others. And for HUD, Office of Inspector General, we typically investigate the consumers of our programs, meaning people outside of the government. Um, we also investigate housing authority employees and housing authority board members. Um, in this section here, I'm going to give you a brief history of the Federal Housing Administration, which is FHA for short. Congress, Congress created the FHA in 1934, and it became part of HUD in 1965. When the FHA was created, the housing industry was flat on its back. Um, millions of construction workers had just lost their jobs, and the terms were too difficult for home buyers to meet in seeking mortgages where they were um, required to put 50% down instead of, you know, we might put 20% down today on a conventional or FHA, you only need 3.5% down. Um, America at the time was primarily a nation of renters where four in 10 households actually own their own homes. Um, by 2001, the nation's homeownership rate had soared to an all-time high of 68% as of the third quarter of that year. FHA and HUD have insured over 34 million home mortgages and 47,000 multifamily project mortgages since 1934. And those numbers have gone up. Uh, some of these numbers are a little dated. Um, the majority of FHA home buyers are first time home buyers. FHA loans are for low to mid income families, but um, nowadays everyone's getting FHA loans. Um, for persons who may not qualify for a conventional loan, you may not have, you may have just sold a house and lost money or been upside down on your previous house, so you may not have the equity or the down payment liquid to put down for a conventional loan. So 
FHA is a really common loan program right now. There's also down payment assistance grants that go out through various cities, counties, and nonprofits where um, different those entities get HUD funding to provide down payment assistance to qualified people. And, I, and I've even seen some of these programs in South Carolina, so they're out there. If, if you ever have some buyers that, that might need down payment assistance, you can refer them to the local local uh, economic development offices to see if they qualify for the programs. Uh, let's talk about some mortgage fraud now. I'm going to give you some of the different schemes in general that I've seen and some I, I may have examples that I've seen in South Carolina. Loan origination fraud, <clears throat> that's just a big category. It could be um, It could be loan officers doing things they're not supposed to do. It could be uh, in South Carolina, a lot of the fraud I've seen, it involves investors who um, are, are flipping properties and everyone knows there's, you know, there's nothing illegal with flipping properties. You know, everyone wants to buy low and sell high. But some of the investors that I've seen in South Carolina that I've had investigations on, um, they're doing everything in their power to get the buyers. They're going out and finding their own buyers. They're not using real estate agents, but they're going out and finding their own buyers by advertising in local community newspapers or country newspapers. They're finding uneducated buyers or first-time home buyers, and they're doing everything under the sun as far as repairing the buyer's credit through prohibited means like um, paying off the buyer's debt and paying off any collections they have, adding the buyers to their personal credit cards. Um, it's called springboarding and they leave them on the card for a, a period of time, maybe six months, and the cre their credit score will, will might rise up into an acceptable range. Some have gone as far as to pay for credit. You can actually rent lines of credit, and they'll rent a line of credit for six months to help their buyers increase their credit scores, and they're providing the down payments for the buyers, even though FHA requires 3.5% down so that the buyers have some skin in the game. We want them to feel like they're invested, that they want to keep their house, they want to keep making the payments. Um, and reverse mortgage fraud, this is a, the HECM program. It's typically for the elderly to take out a reverse mortgage on their house so they have some, some money to live off. Um, I've investigated a few of these in South Carolina. One of them, uh, the person, uh, the the elderly person had a power of attorney and the elderly person passed away one morning and later that day the power of attorney withdrew $25,000 from the HECM, uh, which is illegal. It was basically stealing money from the bank um, and that person pled guilty in federal court. Also another reverse mortgage here in South Carolina that I investigated was a family member of the elderly person didn't have power of attorney at this time, but but did a reverse mortgage and basically took the proceeds of the reverse mortgage to live off herself, leaving the elderly person's um, house in jeopardy and, and they've been in and out of foreclosure proceedings. And um, that one, we, we had trouble prosecuting that one because the elderly person had dementia and couldn't testify to say whether or not her daughter had permission to take the money. Um, so there's not always a happy ending on those reverse mortgage cases. Um, I've investigated short sale fraud here in South Carolina, pre-foreclosure sale program. Uh, that was the one I mentioned with the realtor who was negotiating both sides of the table. He was negotiating for the FHA seller, the FHA borrower who wanted to short sale their property, and the buyer was the realtor's business partner and none of that was disclosed to the bank or HUD and they did a same day flip where they did the short sale and then later that afternoon they f they resold the property for twice what the short sale was when they had already certified on Wells Fargo affidavit saying there was no second deal in the works for that short sale property when they they all knew that there was a second sale plan for the same day because they had signed a contract two weeks prior or at least two weeks prior. 
Um, that same realtor also negotiated short sales for FHA borrowers where his wife was the purchaser. Um, so he's negotiating the price down as low as he can because his wife's buying it. So it sort of defeats the arm's length transaction and HUD prohibits that. Um, I've recently been looking at some, some home rehabilitation fraud in the upstate where HUD gives grants to nonprofits and they give grants to city and county economic development offices for rehabbing houses. Uh, typically it's for low income folks that don't have the money to get a new roof on their house or get a new HVAC system or get new windows. And the nonprofit is a less than, uh, I don't know, they have a low, low moral standard at the nonprofit and they're inflating the invoices and they're double billing different programs for the same work and also billing for work that wasn't done. Um, and so that, that is, it can be a problem and it with rehabilitation fraud. Um, the Good Neighbor Next Door program, I don't think that program is very prevalent here in South Carolina. I think South Carolina has a state program that's the HEROES program or something like that, but, but HUD does have a Good Neighbor Next Door program for, for first responders, EMTs, police officers, and the program is if they, if they, if they get in the process for one of these HUD-owned properties, they can get a 50 percent discount off the appraised value of the house. Uh, up, in, up in Maryland and DC I investigated quite a few of those. Uh, some of them just ended up with civil settlements. Um, not too many of those went criminal because it's hard to prove it, you know, it's hard to say, you know, someone plans on moving into the property and then their life circumstances change, but typically that program requires you to live in the house for three years and you have to do annual certifications to HUD saying you still live there. And sometimes people use those, those properties that they get at 50% off for rental properties. Um, another type of case I investigated here in South Carolina, down payment assistance fraud, where somebody was getting a, a house through one of the CHODO uh, housing development programs and they were supposed to move into it. They didn't move into it for several years. They rented it out. They they falsified living there, and uh, so they basically took advantage of the program. And in the meantime, it was an FHA loan also. So we were kind of getting hit from from multiple sides on that case. Um, equity skimming and foreclosure rescue. I'll I'll get into more of that in, in one of the next slides. Um, as I mentioned, loan origination fraud. I've seen a lot of false gift letters here in South Carolina, and those are on the type of cases where an investor or a speculator are sort of handling the buying and selling without, without realtors uh, being used. Um, typically, the borrower is not related to the person on the gift letter on some of these fraudulent ones. The person on the gift letter may or may not actually exist. Um, or they're just not truly related to the buyer as required by FHA. Um, and the gift giver is it's, per it's the person selling the property. So they're just doing this to disguise who's actually giving the money to the buyer. Um, we've seen a lot of credit repair. I mentioned springboarding the borrower's credit. Um, I have a lady who we're investigating, I'm not going to mention any names, but she added 38 of the buyers to her personal credit card over a couple years. Um, you know, her own personal credit card that she intends to pay every month, so it'll it'll help the buyer's credit rating uh, to go upwards into an acceptable range. Um, there's another uh, loan origination case that we're investigating that the person was photoshopping their own bank statements to create them for the buyers to make it look like the buyers had assets and had the down payment money in their account. They falsified bills of sale for vehicles to make it look like the buyer of the property sold his car so that he would have five grand for the down payment when really the seller was going to provide the down payment but you know behind the scenes. And they'll go as far as actually running the money through the, the relative's account 
and getting bank statements showing that it was in the relative's account and then they'll run the money through the buyer's account. So they'll actually manufacture a paper trail um, so that it passes underwriting and everything. Um, but really it's it, it, the money originated from the seller in these cases. Um, they've created fake verifications of employment and false W-2s. They've created false rental licenses or rental leases rather um, to make it look like if, if the buyer actually owns another property, they'll they'll draw up a fake lease to say, oh, the buyer's gonna they're gonna lease the property that they're living in now so that they can buy the other property. And in those instances, the buyer was kind of a straw buyer. They were probably buying the house for their son or daughter or relative, and they never actually intended to move into it. And, and owner occupancy is a requirement for FHA loans. Um, and as I mentioned before, we've actually seen the sellers paying for rented credit of a buyer to enhance their credit score. Um, there's some company, I don't know if anyone's heard of it, but it's uh, like, uh, I forget what it's called. It's like buymycredit.com or, I mean, there's different, there's different websites that you can actually buy. You can actually rent credit and you can choose, you know, you want to, you want to get an American Express, you know, account with 25,000. You can, you can pay more for a higher credit limit and that'll actually help the people running the credit more. Their, their score will improve more. Um, reverse mortgage fraud, as I mentioned before, this is a, a program for the elderly. It usually involves somebody close to the elderly person taking advantage of them. Um, the bank is the victim sometimes if, if the withdraw withdrawal is made after the mortgager is deceased. Um, they're basically stealing money from the bank or they're stealing money from their other relatives if there's a, a will and testament involved for that person for their passing. They could actually be stealing money from their brothers and sisters. Um, we talked about short sale fraud. Um, I've heard of this being a problem in other states. I, I, I haven't seen too much of it here and sometimes you know, the reason we do these type of presentations is to to get some some knowledge out there of, of what type of schemes are out there and, and to try to get some case case leads from from you all that are out there seeing different stuff every day. Um, but a short sale, everyone, I would assume everyone knows what a short sale is and just sometimes these are manipulated by somebody that intends to buy, you know, to sell low and, and, and they'll they try to flip them, and sometimes the flip is legitimate. Sometimes they'll, they, you know, they're not supposed to be an interested party to the transaction, and that's where it gets into some fraud. But if somebody buys a short sale, fixes it up, and resells it, there's nothing wrong with that as long as they're not negotiating it, <clears throat> as long as they don't have an interest in if they're representing the seller. Um, home rehab fraud, I talked about this in the upstate. Um, this can be, these aren't huge frauds like, like typical loan origination fraud, but it can be in padding of invoices and inflating invoices. And when you get into the double billing where you're sending a bill to, to a, somebody like South Carolina Housing Trust and you're also sending a bill to the federal home loan banks for the same work, um, it can really increase the amount of money that the government's going to lose. Um, like I mentioned, the Good Neighbor Next Door program, it's a HUD program for first responders, nurses, EMTs. Um, they're basically buying a HUD REO property at half, half the value of its appraisal. They have to reside in it for three years, or, or if they self-report that they're moving out before their three years are up, um, they can repay a portion of the down payment assistance that they got by only having to pay 50% of the proceeds. And like I mentioned, I haven't really seen this program in South Carolina, so I don't know that it's really being used here. I don't know if the state program is more beneficial to the buyer. Um, I'm not really too familiar with this, the state program. Um, but when we see fraud in this program, it's typically that the buyer or the program participant is falsely certifying that they're still they're still occupying the property as as they're supposed to for three years. Each year there's a certification, and I've seen cases um, in Baltimore where they actually did live there for a year, 
and then if you if you subpoena the uh, the power records, you can see that they started running it out at, at a certain point in time or something. Um, down payment assistance fraud. Participant receives HUD funds for their down payment through an intermediary with a residency requirement. I know here in Columbia, in the Columbia area, like Richland, Richland County Economic Development Office, um, I know they have a program. And I'm sure most counties have some type of program. And some of the some of the requirements vary um, whether or not they have to be a first-time home buyer um, or whether or not the, the amount of time they have to live there. Uh, the down payment assistance is typically a forgivable grant that if they live there for 10 years, then the 15 grand or the 10 grand they got as down payment assistance is forgiven. They don't have to repay HUD or the county uh, for the funds. Um, I had one here in the in the Columbia area that the person they never intended to use the property as their their primary residence, and it was basically an investment property. Equity skimming and foreclosure rescue. I haven't seen a lot of this in South Carolina, um, but this is when the property someone you know a foreclosure rescue artist they'll do research they'll see that a property has equity and they'll find a distressed mortgage or somebody who's having financial trouble. Sometimes they, they'll do this through churches or community groups is how they figure out. They get a lot of information about people. They'll, they'll approach the person who's struggling with their mortgage and they'll promise to pay them and, and start making, they'll, they'll promise to take over the mortgage payments um, and they'll quit claim deed the property to themselves. Um, they won't make the mortgage payments Sometimes they even kick out the homeowner and they tell them that they're going to rent out their property for them. And then they don't make any tax payments. They don't make the insurance escrow payments. Uh, sometimes they might even rent it out to somebody under the Section 8 program. So then they're getting a check from the city or county also that administers the program. And within a year or two, um, you know, within a couple months, they're going to start getting foreclosure letters. Um, and they would try to hide those from the true owner. And the true owner, um, the invest when the investor fails to make the payments, sometimes the investor will f file false bankruptcies to just they just want to drag it out as long as they can, so they can keep getting payments from Section 8 or from an actual renter, from a, a paying renter. Um, it results in def a, a, an eventual default and a foreclosure eviction of tenants. Uh, sometimes the properties just they get burned out or abandoned. Um, and any fraud against FHA, uh, it's, it's taxpayer money that has to pay back the banks. You know, FHA loans are, are government insured loans where the government is saying we will pay the bank back if there's a foreclosure on this on this loan. The impact of mortgage fraud, defaults and foreclosures um, your property value and your tax dollars suffer. There's legal cost, you know, with any foreclosure and bankruptcy, there's there's legal cost to FHA, to the borrowers, to the banks. Um, it affects the secondary market for the securities when the mortgages are sold in securities. Um, it takes money out of the FHA insurance fund, which is all taxpayer money. It sometimes creates an artificial real estate market. I want to show you some pictures here. Um, I think these are from like Chicago or Detroit, but you know, this is, this can be the result, you know, when uh, foreclosures, you, I mean, you wouldn't want these in your neighborhood. Um, just abandoned properties and, and a lot of the Everything gets stripped out of them. This one is, I think, a three three pictures of, a, of this house going into the tank. Here's the first one. There's oh, there's the first one. It still it looks like a nice decent house there, and then it just goes downhill the when it's burned out. Part of the purpose of this webinar is to tell you that you know you can report mortgage fraud to HUD, Office of Inspector General. Um, I cover the whole state, and 
we have more agents in Atlanta and in North Carolina. And uh, but you can always call my my desk number here is listed. Uh, my email address is listed, and also the the email the uh, web address for our agency hudoyg.gov. Um, if there's any questions, you can feel free to email them to me. And if I don't know the answer, I will put you in touch with uh, one of the, the single family program specialists. And uh, I will try to get you an answer as soon as I can. I also I have contacts at the housing at the Hawk in Atlanta, which is kind of the one of the four big regional FHA offices. They can answer anything there. So I'll get you answers as soon as I can. And if you have any if you come across any things that you think would be, uh, you know, meet the threshold for some of the some of the different schemes we we talked today, um, I wouldn't really say there's, you know, no case is too small. Um, I just got a question: Does your does our agency investigate wire fraud? We do. That wire fraud is frequently used with mortgage fraud. Um, when we talk about mortgage fraud, there's no there's no federal mortgage fraud charge. I mean, you're going to be charged with wire fraud or mail fraud. Um, there's a few different HUD charges that are uh, false statements to HUD or false statements on HUD transactions, but typically there's going to be a wire fraud or a mail fraud that goes with any mortgage fraud case. Uh, sometimes conspiracy, a lot of these things, it's hard to do mortgage fraud by yourself, so we always look for who else might have been involved with with helping you? But yes, we do investigate wire fraud. Um, if there's any other questions out there, feel free to to send them in via the chat on the GoToWebinar app. Um, you can also email them to me, and I will um, I'll get back to you as soon as as soon as I can. Um, If there's, if there's no other questions there, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up for today. We appreciate you uh, listening in and, and anyone that that goes to the webinar, um, the webinar uh, historical uh, archive. The archive. We appreciate you watching and give us a call if you have any questions or if you uh, 